Next Sunday, I want to give you a bunch, start to give you a bunch of examples of how God has delivered his people over the ages. And I've been telling you about this for a while, and we'll finally get there next Sunday towards the end of the sermon, Lord willing. But before we do that this Sunday, I want to talk about how sometimes God does not deliver his children, even from death. And I'm going to give you many examples, quite a few of them, of not bad people that God allowed to die as a judgment, but good people, Christian people, that God allowed to suffer and die for no fault of their own whatsoever. And we're going to look at these. And this should be, this should be um, sobering, but it should also be encouraging. Now, whether God d- decides to deliver us or whether he decides to let us be martyred for the faith is his decision to make. And we really, I don't think, can have any idea what that decision might be. John the Baptist, before his head was cut off, probably didn't think that was going to happen to him. Or James, when he was killed in prison, or any number of the martyrs, didn't think that that probably was going to happen to them, especially given the fact that they were apostles and prophets and great men of God. So we don't know who it is will be martyred and who it is will be spared. We just need to be ready for either one. In the day of prosperity, be joyful. In the day of adversity, consider God has set the one over against the other to the end that man cannot find anything of him. Uh, That's in Ecclesiastes 7 and 14, I think it is. So why does God do this? Why does God sometimes allow his children to be martyred and not deliver them from death when he could? Because obviously God could deliver every one of his people from death and not allow that to happen to them. Well, I can think of at least three reasons why God allows this to happen. The first one is that God is glorified in the death of his faithful saints if they die for him. Now, if you go out and get hammered and wreck your car and die, God does not receive glory in your death. But if you are martyred for him because you're standing up for him and you're holding fast to the faith, then that is a glorifying thing for the Lord. If you turn with me to John chapter 21 and verse 19, Jesus, these are some of his last words that he ever made on this earth. He was talking to Peter and he told Peter three times to feed his sheep. Peter had denied him three times. He tells him three times to feed his sheep. He asked him if he loved him, and he said that he did. And he said, feed my sheep. And then he tells Peter what Peter's end is going to be. In verse 18, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. That's what happens when we're young. We've got lots of energy. We do whatever we want. We go wherever we want. We do what we want. But it doesn't, that doesn't last. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should die, or by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. He's telling Peter that Peter's going to be crucified. You'll stretch forth thy hands. And that's, that's indeed what happened, according to history anyway, what happened to Peter. Peter wanted to be crucified upside down because he didn't feel worthy to be crucified right side up like Jesus was. And when Jesus tells him that you're going to die a death that will glorify God, then he follows it up with two words, follow me. He didn't say run from it. He didn't say avoid it. He said, follow me. And that's exactly what Peter did for the rest of his life. And then another reason why God does not deliver his children from death sometimes is that In some cases, the martyr is actually spared suffering that others will have to endure. And really, his death is actually a mercy from God. Look at Isaiah 57 and verse 1. Isaiah 57 and verse 1. Let me tell you what. If I was a Christian in the Soviet Union or in Ukraine, I would have much rather that the Stalinites came by and guillotined me then starved me to death in the Ukrainian famine or sent me up to a gulag in Siberia or something where I was worked to the bone and died a miserable death. Much rather have had the guillotine. If they were, I don't know if they were using the guillotine. The French used it anyway. I'd rather have been guillotined in the French Revolution than tortured to death or some horrible thing like that. 
So there are worse things than death. Uh, In Isaiah 57 and verse 1, it says, The righteous perisheth, and no man layeth it to heart. And merciful men are taken away, none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. When a righteous man perishes, we think, why? Why, Lord, especially if they were young? Why? Why would you allow them to die? But we don't consider that, you know, maybe that was a mercy. Maybe they were taken away from the evil to come, the evil that the rest of us will see, or maybe just some personal evil in that person's life that he or she would have seen that he or she doesn't have to see. So it can be a mercy from God. And then thirdly, the death of God's saints is precious in his sight. The Lord is actually gets joy from the death of his saints. And it's not because he likes to see them die, but it's because he's glorified when they die and then they come to heaven to be with him. Uh, In Psalm 116 and verse 15. Psalm 116 and verse 15. It says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. So when one of God's saints dies, it's precious. Precious means valuable. That's a a, a valuable thing for the Lord when one of his saints dies because they have ceased from their works and now gone on to heaven to be with him, to worship him in person. Look at Isaiah, not Isaiah, look at uh, Revelation 14 and verse 13. Revelation 14, 13. John says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. He didn't say, he didn't say cursed are the dead. You know, woe to the dead that die in the Lord. He said, Blessed. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Right there is God's retirement program. You work until you die and then you rest from your labors. This is a blessing from God. To die as a Christian is a blessing. They're blessed. Now let's look at some of these examples. Uh, We're going to start just way back in the beginning. I'm going to start with the first martyr and we're going to go up through uh, the end of the New Testament. The first martyr is, of course, Abel. He was the son, uh, the second son of Adam and Eve. He was the first martyr. If you turn with me to Matthew 23, Matthew 23, verse 35, taking me a minute because I started to turn back to Genesis not realizing uh, that I wasn't going to go there just yet. Matthew 23 and verse 35. It says that upon you, Jesus is speaking here to the Pharisees, <clears throat> to the same men that are conspiring to kill him, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechias, whom ye slew between the temple and and the altar. A to Z. Just think that's interesting. First martyr to the last martyr of the Old Testament. We'll look at Zechariah next. So this says from the blood of righteous Abel. Now if you compare this with Luke chapter 11 and verse 50 and 51, we'll see that Abel was a prophet. So we put it together and we see that he was a righteous prophet. Luke eleven fifty through 51. It says, and the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. From the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zechariah, which perished between the altar and the temple. So you put those together, Abel was a righteous prophet. Now you'd wonder why God would allow a prophet to perish. But then you'd wonder even more, why would he allow a righteous prophet, a good prophet to perish? But he did. Abel was a good man. He made his offering to God by faith. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4. Not only was he a prophet, but he was just a faithful servant of God that did what God said. Abel wasn't like his brother. Abel's brother, Cain, 
just did whatever he wanted. He was like most people today that think that they should be able to worship God however they want to, however it feels good, whatever they think is right, that's how they should worship. And a lot of churches follow that same pattern. We, we just worship God how we think God wants to be worshipped, and we assume God will like this music program, or we assume he'll like this program, or he'll like a children's church program, or a Sunday school, or whatever. People assume what they think God would like because it's what seems right to them, and then they worship him that way. That's the way of Cain. God had told Abel that he wanted a bloody sacrifice. He wanted an animal sacrifice. Now, how do I know that God had told Abel that? Because you don't, you're not going to read those words in the Bible because of what I read right here. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. By faith, Abel offered this more excellent sacrifice. Now, where does faith come from? According to Romans chapter 10. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing comes from where? The word of God, right? So, where did Abel get the information that he was able then to make a more excellent sacrifice by? Where did he get that information? Through faith, which comes from the word of God. So, God, in other words, God told him that he wanted a sacrifice made of an animal, a bloody sacrifice. And given that Abel was a prophet that we just read about, what do prophets do? They declare the word of God to other people. Who are the other people around that Abel would have been prophesying to? Cain, Adam and Eve possibly, but Cain. So did Cain know that he was supposed to offer a bloody sacrifice of an animal? Yes, he did because Abel did it by faith and Abel's a prophet and he obviously told Cain. But what did Cain do? Offer to the fruit of the ground. He wanted to do what he wanted to do. So Abel was a good man. He worshiped by the book. But guess what he got for worshiping by the book? Guess what he got for being a good man? He got killed. Look at Genesis 4 and verse 8. As the old cynical saying goes, no good deed goes unpunished. Genesis 4 and verse 8. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Cain knew how to get rid of the pricking in his conscience and that condemning, uh, you know, the, the word of God that was condemning him and where he didn't feel good because God didn't accept his sacrifice. He knew what to do about that. Just kill the preacher. Right? You just get rid of the preacher. Get rid of the guy that's telling me where I'm wrong and then I won't feel bad anymore. And that's what he did. He killed him because of envy. Look at uh, 1 John 3 and verse 12. 1 John 3 and verse 12. You know, the old saying, shoot the messenger. Well, that's exactly what Cain did. Shot the messenger. First John 3 and verse 12. It says, Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Why did he slay him? Because his own works were evil, and his brothers righteous. His brothers were righteous because they were according to the word of God. Right? He made a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So God didn't spare Abel's life, even though he was a righteous man. He was a prophet. He worshipped God just how God said. He did everything just right. We don't read about Abel doing anything wrong. Now, he was a sinner like the rest of us. But we don't read about him doing anything that would have merited judgment from God or, or premature death or anything like that. And yet, Abel died at the hand of his murderous brother for no good reason, of course, that we can see, just looking at it as outside of observers. But clearly, God has a reason for these things. Now, if God didn't spare Abel, and Abel was a righteous prophet, he might not spare you, and he might not spare me. Because why would I expect God to spare me when I'm not half the man that Abel was? He might not spare me either. And I think it's quite possible... I think it's even likely that I'll probably end up in prison someday for my faith, for preaching the word, for conducting church. I really believe that. I could be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. I'm not, not wishing for it or anything. I, I used to often think years back, 
And I talk about, you know, what are we going to do if the government comes after us? We're going to keep going to church. And at that point, it was more of a hypothetical thing where I thought, you know, it could happen, but it's kind of honestly a little bit hard to imagine it happening in this country several years ago. Now it's not hard to imagine at all. I mean, we've, we've lived it over the last year. And I think the last year was just a dress rehearsal. I, I don't think that they're going to take their ball and go home. I think that they're going to uh, continue. And we've seen what's happened in Canada. Canada is just a step ahead of us. Preachers are putting, being put in jail um, for preaching the word, for just simply holding church. So I think it's very possible that I could end up in jail someday. And I'm, I'm uh, preparing myself for that mentally, spiritually. And, uh, you know, and if that happens, uh, it happens. But I'm convinced, like I told you over a year ago, when this whole corona nonsense first started, I mean, before it really got in even in full swing, where I could see where it was going, and I could see also it was basically a hoax from the beginning, that yeah, there was a virus, but it, it wasn't going to kill the amount of people that they predicted it was going to kill, and that was pretty obvious just from the numbers. But anyway, you remember at the very beginning, I told you that we are not going to cancel church here, ever. We're going to have church, period. I'm not going to cancel church. And that's why I think that I'll probably end up going to jail someday, because I think one of these days, what's happening in Canada is going to happen here. And it could very well happen. And I'm resolved by the grace of God, we're not going to cancel church, period. Now, we may have church somewhere, out hiding away somewhere or something, but we're going to have church, period. Now, God might cancel church, and then that's fine. God can cancel church. If we get three feet of snow some winter, God cancels church. I'm never going to cancel church, right? If, if I can possibly be in church and Austin's got a four-wheel drive, chances are I can be here. We're going to have church. Now, whether the rest of you here or not, as long as there's one other person, one other person, because Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst of them. So if one other person can be here with me, we're having church. Now, if nobody can be here, then God canceled church. I'm not going to cancel it. It's the same way with a virus or a pandemic or government persecution or anything. I am not canceling church. God could cancel it. We could all come down with deadly illnesses and we could all die or we could all be physically incapable of leaving our beds. And if that's the case, then church is canceled by de facto, uh, de facto cancel. But I'm not going to cancel it. And that's why I believe that I hold such a hard stand on that point that I will probably end up in jail someday. It will not surprise me, but I think it's that important that I would be willing to go to jail for that because God said we ought to obey God rather than men. Peter said that, but under the inspiration of God. Not to mention the wokeism culture. I don't know if you're familiar with woke. You probably, maybe you haven't even heard of it, but I may preach on wokeism one of these days. But um, <clears throat> wokeism is this idea that people that are awake to racial injustice and people that are awake to... Um, uh, human in uh, human injustices, basically people that want, how do I say it? <laughs> they are people that believe that all white people are racists, that black people are oppressed, and that you're a racist even if you don't know you're a racist, like the critical race theory. And if you're not familiar with that, that's, that's another topic. Uh, it's stuff like that. It's people that are awa- awakened to the plight of the sodomites, of the transgender people, of the people that want to be able to use whatever gender pronoun they want to use, whatever they want to be called by. I don't know if you've heard about this stuff, but it's everywhere. I mean, this is not in a corner somewhere. This is happening everywhere. People are losing their jobs over this stuff. Um, it's a real, a real problem. And it's insanity. And if you don't go along with it, you'll get canceled. It's cancel culture. You get kicked off of social media. You get kicked off of YouTube. You get kicked out of your job. People have been fired for this stuff just for simply saying, a man the other day said in a tweet that a man cannot give birth. And he was banned from Twitter for saying a man cannot give birth. Because in these crazy people's minds, men can give birth. You know how? Because if you're a woman and you think you're a man, you're a man and therefore men can give birth. This is the insane world that we live in. 
So when you stand up against this kind of garbage, you're going to be persecuted. So yeah, that's why I think, you know, it'll probably happen to me one of these days. But anyway, I'm not worried about it. I just wanted you to be aware of that. So maybe you want to pray for me. If you like having a preacher, then pray for me. There was a guy named Naboth the Jezreelite. He's not in the outline, and I'm not going to go there, but he's another example of a guy that didn't do anything wrong. As a matter of fact, he did the right thing because in Israel, when you were given an inheritance of land, that inheritance stayed in your family. And even if you were poor and you sold that to somebody, in the day of Jubilee, it all went back. Everybody's land went back to their families. So you you just didn't give up your land. You didn't give it away or sell it or something. Well, Naboth had a vineyard right next to King Ahab's property. And King Ahab wanted that vineyard. And he went to Nabal and he said, hey, I'll give you a better vineyard. I'll give you compensation for it. And Naboth said, no, I, this, no, this is my vineyard. I'm, this is my, my land given to me by God. No, I'm not giving it up. And Ahab got upset about that and started whining to his wife. And she came up with this wicked scheme of taking Naboth and setting him up and, and creating a kangaroo court and saying that he blasphemed God and I forget what else and um, found him guilty of that. And they stoned him and they killed him and his family. And then Ahab was able to take the land. And this poor guy didn't do anything except for stand up for what was right. And he was killed. Then another example in the Old Testament was Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah. Now there's two Zechariahs in the Bible. There's two prophet Zechariahs. Now turn with me to Matthew 23 and verse 35. Matthew 23 and verse 35. Jesus said, we've, we already just read this verse a minute ago, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Zechariah was martyred because he condemned the people of Judah for their idolatry. Look at Second Chronicles 24, 18-22. Now, I'm not going to go into a bunch of detail as to why this is the Zechariah that, uh, that Jesus was talking about here, because like I said, there are two. And here's the interesting thing. I'll just briefly mention this. Uh, just go ahead and turn there to Second Chronicles 24. I'm going to turn somewhere else. Just to double check something. Yeah. Zechariah the prophet in Zechariah chapter 1 was Zechariah the son of Berechiah. So you'd think that he's referring to Zechariah the prophet, the second to last book of the Old Testament, when he was referring to the prophet Zechariah son of Berechiah that was killed between the, the uh, altar, the, uh, what did he say, the temple and the altar. But actually it was not that prophet Zechariah that wrote the book of Zechariah. I've actually taught, I've taught you that before in the series on the Christian in the Old Testament, I think. But anyway, here's the passage um, that, the, that Jesus was referring to in uh, 2 Chronicles 18, 24, 24, 18 through 22. It says, And they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served groves and idols, and wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this their trespass. Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them again unto the Lord, and they testified against them, but they would not give ear. And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, which stood above the people, and said unto them, Thus saith God, Why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord, that ye cannot prosper? Because ye have forsaken the Lord, he also, or he hath also forsaken you. And they conspired against him, and stoned him with stones at the commandment of the king in the court of the house of the Lord. Now, the inner court was between the temple and the altar. You can see that in Ezekiel Eight in verse sixteen, which I'm not going to go to. So this is this is the guy he's talking about. They stoned him between the temple and the altar in the inner court there. Now the only problem with this is it says Zechariah, uh, Zechariah the son of Jehoiada, but Jesus said it was the son of Berechiah. But um, 
Jehoiada, I'm assuming is probably another name for Berechias. Jehoiada means praise the Lord and Berechias means bless the Lord. So the two names mean something very similar. So more than likely, Jehoiada was another name for Berechias. And furthermore, there is no mention um, of the prophet Zechariah in the book of Zechariah um, being killed. And furthermore, uh, Zechariah, in the book of Zechariah, prophesied after the temple was destroyed and he was prophesying to get them to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. So the temple wasn't even around when Zechariah's prophesied it had been destroyed and it was being rebuilt. So he was not the one that was, that was martyred. It was this Zechariah here in Second Chronicles chapter 24. But anyway, be that as it may, the point that I want here is here's a righteous prophet, Zechariah. The people of Israel have gone into idolatry and he follows God's commission and command and goes and, and, and preaches to them to repent. And what happens to him? They kill him. He didn't do anything wrong. He did nothing worthy of death. But again, he ends up being martyred anyway. Now, this shouldn't depress you, though. This should invigorate you. It would be an honor and a blessing to be martyred for Jesus Christ. Martyrs get a crown in heaven. So, the thought of, oh, maybe I'll be martyred, if that scares you or if that depresses you or if that makes you feel low, it shouldn't. You're not thinking right. You should be thinking, I would be blessed to be a martyr. Now, I'm not saying you should go out there and try to be a martyr. I'm not saying you should pray to be a martyr or you should just walk out and start finding every trans person you can find by calling and start calling them the opposite pronoun just to make them mad. I'm not saying that. But I am saying, don't run from it. Remember what Jesus told Peter? Follow me. Don't run from it. He that will save his life shall lose it, Jesus said. And he that will lose my life, or his life for my sake, shall find it. And then we have John the Baptist. He was the first New Testament martyr. And he was the greatest prophet to ever live. And the reason for that was that he was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. Turn with me to Luke chapter 7, 26 through 28. Luke chapter 7, 26 through 28. Jesus said, But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? He's talking about John. Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet, this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. And I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Jesus said that there is not a greater prophet than John of all them that are born of women. So in other words, John was the greatest prophet that ever lived. And he gives you the reason for that, or one of the reasons for that, right there in the text. He was the one that announced the coming of the Messiah. He was the one that cried in the wilderness, the greatest prophet that ever lived. But did you know that every single one of you that are members of this church are greater than John? It says, he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So take the, per let's have a vote. Who, who's least in this church? Who do we think is the lowest guy? Yeah. Okay, there, well, there you go. Okay, I was trying to be funny, but you're right, right? We all are, right? So whoever's least of us, and it doesn't matter. I mean, we couldn't figure that out if we wanted to, and it, it's, it's immaterial. But the point is, the lowliest member of this church, whoever he or she be, is greater than John the Baptist. Why is he greater than John the Baptist? Well, let's just compare knowledge. What did John know versus what you know? You know a heck of a lot more about Jesus Christ than John did. John knew he was the Messiah. John knew he was virgin born. John saw the spirit descend on him as a dove. John knew that he was the, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. But John didn't have Paul's epistles. John didn't have Peter and John's epistles. John didn't have all of the information in the New Testament that we have. John wasn't even sure whenever he, when he went into prison that Jesus was the Messiah anymore. You remember that? John was put into prison and John sends his disciples to Jesus and he said, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? John starts to doubt whether Jesus is even the Messiah in prison. 
He that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. We know more about Christ than John the Baptist did. Not because we're better Christians than John was. Not because we're smarter than he was. Just because we simply have the book right here that tells us all this stuff. And John didn't have this. John had the Old Testament. You know what the Old Testament was? Types and shadows and signs and pictures. We have far more information about Christ and what actually happened. Well, John didn't even see Jesus crucified. He never even lived to see it. He didn't. I mean, there's so much that he would not have known. Well, John got himself into trouble because he rebuked the king for his sin and he was put into prison for it. Look at Matthew 14 and verse 34. Matthew 14 and 3 through 4, pardon me. Matthew 14, 3 through 4. I like that when I said, who's least in the kingdom of God? And everybody raised their own hands. I was expecting everybody to start pointing at everybody else. But. Matthew 14, 3 through 4. For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. For John uh, said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude, because they counted him as a prophet. So John was put into prison because he rebuked the king. He told King Herod, he had the audacity to tell him, It's not lawful. It's wrong for you to take your brother's wife. That's called adultery. You can't do that, Herod. And Herod says, Oh, yes, I can. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put you in prison, and I'm not going to hear any more of this. And he would have killed him, except he was a politician and, you know, he licked his finger, put it up to the wind, figured which way it's going and says, oh, people like John better not do this. That's why public opinion is important because these politicians, they don't care about you and they don't care about me. They care about one person and that's themselves. But if they think something that they want to do will be unpopular and they will get voted out the next election, oh, they'll change. So public opinion does matter. The rulers rule by the consent of the governed. But anyway, so he rebukes the king and he gets put into prison for it. And then, to add insult to injury, Herod has this birthday party for himself. And he invites a bunch of his lords there. And he has his, it would be his stepdaughter slash niece, because it was his wife's daughter, which his wife happens to be his sister-in-law, because it was his brother Philip's wife. So it's his stepdaughter slash niece come and belly dance before him and his buddies. Now talk about a good guy. I mean, it's bad enough to have a belly dancer come in, but then when it's your stepdaughter and your niece, I mean, what kind of a pig is this? So he has this done and he gets so excited. He foolishly tells this girl that, hey, you can have anything you want up to half the kingdom. That was a really dumb thing to say. Well, she goes back and talks to her mother and her mother says, I'll tell you what you want. You want John the Baptist's head in a charger. Verses 6 through 10. But when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod, whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. In another place it says up to half the kingdom. And she, being before instructed of her mother, said, actually her mother told her ahead of time, maybe this whole thing was in the plans. Pretty good plan. And she being Uh, before instructed of her mother, said, Give me here John Baptist's head in a charger. And the king was very sorry. Nevertheless, for the oath's sake, and them which sat with him at meat, he commanded it to be given her, and he sent and beheaded John in the prison. Now, it kind of looks like Herod had a bit of a change of heart because he would have killed him, it said there just earlier, but he wouldn't do it for the people's sake. But now he feels bad that John's going to be beheaded. And maybe he just feels bad because it was just because of his foolish behavior. And now here this guy is going to be killed for that. But anyway, the point is, John ends up beheaded. What did John do to to merit being beheaded? He did the right thing. He did the hard thing. He condemned the king. He told the king he was wrong. He was committing adultery. Can you imagine if old Billy Graham, back when he was alive, if he would have gone to the Oval Office and told Bill Clinton, you are wrong for what you did for your fornication with Monica Lewinsky. And his head got chopped off for it. Can you imagine? Bill Clinton just saying, all right, off with your head. 
I mean, he wouldn't. I mean, Bill Clinton wouldn't do that. He would have him killed in secret, you know, shooting himself four times in the back of the head behind the ear, you know, with the wrong hand or something, and then have blood running uphill down his head when he's laying there like Vince Foster. But anyway, Clinton would have probably would have had him killed, but it would have just been not quite so blatant and obvious. You don't want to get on the wrong side of the Clintons. There have been about 50 people that have tried that, and it didn't work out so well for them. But anyway, there's poor John, greatest prophet that ever lived. If God ever was going to pick somebody to say, you know what, I'm going to spare you from a lot of hardship. I'm going to spare you from a premature death. I'm going to spare you from prison. It probably would have a good chance in our carnal minds of being the greatest prophet that ever lived. And yet the greatest prophet that ever lived gets put into prison and gets his head taken off for doing the right thing. Just just remember that. So the next time you do the right thing and you end up being punished for it, don't throw your hands up and be like, but, but, but I did the right thing. Why am I in jail? Why is this happening to me? It's because you did the right thing. That's why. Don't be surprised when that happens. As though some strange thing happened to you. Isn't that what the Bible tells us? That if you're persecuted as a Christian... You know, don't, don't just wonder like some strange things happen to you. Now, the next uh, martyr is the greatest of all. And that, of course, is our Lord Jesus Christ. He was a martyr. If there ever was one, he certainly was. Now, talk about being a good man. Abel was a good man. Zechariah was a good man. John was a good man. But now we're talking about the perfect man. The man that never sinned. Remember what 1 Peter 2 and verse 22 says? That Jesus Christ never sinned. So talk about a guy that didn't deserve it. He's different than the rest. Because Abel, though he was a good man, was still a sinner. Wages of sin is death. I mean, Abel deserves death just by way of the fact that he's a sinner. Zechariah, John, all the prophets were sinners. But Jesus Christ didn't even sin. 1 Peter chapter in verse 22. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Not only did he not sin when times were easy, he didn't sin when it would have been almost impossible for the rest of us not to sin. When he was being reviled and persecuted and mistreated and abused, he still didn't sin. And Jesus Christ is the only person that never had one single legitimate crime or offense laid to his charge. John chapter 8 and verse 46. Now the rest of us, we would be absolute fools to stand here in front of this church, especially if your spouse is present, and say, which of you convinceth me of sin? And your spouse is going to say, uh, let me get the list out. You know, Your kids are going to say that. Your parents are going to say that. Anybody that knows you is going to say that. None of us would be dumb enough to make that kind of a statement. But Jesus Christ could stand there in front of a multitude and say, which of you convinceth me of sin? Come on, step up, tell me. Prove that I'm a sinner. Give me one example when I've sinned. He could do that. And he did. John 8 and verse 46. John 8, 46, Jesus said, Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? That's a rhetorical question, and the answer was none of them. Now, to convince means to convict. See, convinced, we, we, it was used differently originally in 1611. Um, the, the primary definition um, is not what we use today. But this is what the King James was using. Uh, to con- convince means to convict, prove, demonstrate, to prove a person to be guilty or in the wrong, especially by judicial procedure, to prove or find guilty, to convict. That's a kind of an easy one to remember what it means because they kind of sound the same. Convince, convict. Just remember that. Convince equals convict. Which of you convicteth me of sin? And they, they had nothing they could say. Look at John 18 and verse 38. When Jesus went before Pilate and he was standing there on trial for his life and Pilate had done what the word convince means, proved to be guilty by judicial procedure. Pilate went to the people. He sent them to Herod. He, 
he, he, he had people come forward and prove to me that this guy is worthy of death. He put him on trial. And guess what Pilate found? John 8 and verse 38, Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find no fault at all. I find in him no fault at all. Nothing. He had not one thing that he could lay to the charge of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ had no sin. He was holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 26. Hebrews seven twenty six. So for such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Now, if a man who is holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners ends up martyred, what hope do we have of saying, you know what, Lord, I'm a really good guy. I've been really faithful. I don't deserve this. And I know that you're not going to allow me to be martyred because I'm such a good Christian. You don't have a prayer. You don't have a prayer. Neither do I. Jesus did always what pleased God. John 8 and verse 29. Who of us can say that? Who of us can stand here and say that I always do that which pleases God? Of course, none of us can. We'd be lucky to say, I once in a while do things that please God. John 8 and verse 29. And he that sent me is with me. This is Jesus speaking. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. If there's ever a man that God is going to spare from being martyred, right there it is, the man that always does those things which please God. And furthermore, Jesus pleaded with God that he would not put him to death. Luke 22 and verse 42. Saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. So here's a man that never sinned, a man that nobody can even prove that he's sinned. Here's a man that's wholly harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, always does the things that please God. And then here's a man that even asks and pleads with God to not allow this to happen to him. And yet, he still ends up martyred. And then they set up false witnesses against him. Mark 14, 15, 55. Mark 14, 55, 59 through... Let me say that again. Mark 14, 55 through 59. And the chief priests and all the council sought for witness against Jesus to put him to death and found none. For many bear false witness against him, but their witness agreed not together. And there arose certain and bear false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days will I, I will build another made without hands. But neither did so did their witness agree together. So they come up with these guys just to make up lies. Jesus was referring to the temple of his body when he said that. He wasn't referring to the physical temple, and they're trying to take things out of context and blow them out of proportion. But their witness doesn't agree together. Then he ends up being beaten, Mark 15 and verse 15. Here's the holy, sinless Son of God, never did anything wrong, always did the things which please God. Verse 15, And so Pilate, willing to content the people... Released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. And I've already talked in this series what it is to be scourged. It's a severe whipping and a flogging. Excruciatingly painful. Then they spit on him in verse 19. And they smote him with the hand, uh, on the head with a reed and did spit upon him. And bowing their knees worshipped him. So they spit on him. They mocked him. There they bowed the knee and worshipped him. And then in verse 20 they mocked him again when they had mocked him. They took off the purple from him and put, uh, uh, put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. They humiliated him and then ultimately crucified him. Verse 25, and, when, uh, and it was the third hour and they crucified him. So despite doing nothing wrong, being a sinless man, nevertheless, God allowed Jesus Christ to be martyred. Now in his case, 
We know what the purpose was for it. The purpose was to save us from our sins because he bore our own sins in his own body to the tree. That he being made sin, he was made sin for us, that we who, that he who knew no sin might be, he was made sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. There in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So yes, it was for a purpose. But you know what? All of God's children get martyred for a purpose. It's a different purpose than Christ. Christ was not martyred for the same reason that Abel was or the same reason that the other prophets were. But yet the other prophets still had a purpose in their death. And I talked about that at the beginning of the service, what those purposes might be. Glorifying God is one of them. Then we have Stephen. Stephen, it says in Acts 6 and verse 8, was a good man and full of faith. Acts 6 and verse 8. Think about the martyrs that we've looked at so far. Just think about the martyrs that you can think of. How many of the martyrs were just average, lukewarm, lackadaisical Christians? None of them. How many of the martyrs were just lousy Christians? You know, the guys that go to church on Christmas and Easter or something. None of them, of course. Every martyr you can think about is some of the best people in the entire Bible. That's the ones that God allows to be killed. Think about that. Acts 6 and verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Full of faith. That means he was a faithful person. He didn't have any doubt. He believed in God with all of his heart, mind, soul, and strength. He earnestly defended the faith, and his wisdom was not able to be resisted. Acts 6 and verse 10. And when they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake, then they did what they did to Jesus Christ and they suborned witnesses and made up all this stuff about him. Verse 11 through 14. Then they suborned men, suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses, which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. So they make up a bunch of lies about him. They turn the people against him. And then he gives his defense for an entire chapter. And he gives a history, a nice history of the Old Testament, nation of Israel. And then he gets to the end. And he enrages them so badly with his testimony because he condemned them for the stiff-necked and uncircumcised and heart and ears people that they were that always did resist the Holy Ghost, as he said there in verse 51. They were so angry about this, they killed him. They stoned him. Verses 54 through 60. Acts 7, 54 through 60. It says, When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly unto heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. That's the only place in the Bible that I'm aware of that says that Jesus was standing at the right hand of God. There are many places where that says that he is seated at the right hand of God. He sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high in Hebrews chapter 1. That's the only place that I know of that he was standing at the right hand of God. Now, I know I've made this point before, but I'm going to make it again because I think it's so neat. And it's not original to me. Pastor Boffy was the first one that I heard say this before. Why was Jesus standing at the right hand of God? If you think about it, there would be two times when you would stand up. You stand up in honor of somebody. If we were all sitting, if this wasn't church, we're just all sitting here just in, you know, enjoying conversation, and um, somebody very, that we all honor very much, Ben Mott. Ben Mott walks in the door. We're all going to stand up probably. I was going to say Joe Biden, but I don't know if any of you stand up. But anyway, so Ben Mott walks in and everybody stands up out of respect, right? Or some, you know, if you're in the, if you people in the military know what I'm talking about. You're sitting in the chow hall and the four-star general walks in, buddy, you're going to be standing up in a second out of respect. And because you don't want to be thrown in the break or something or get, you're getting in trouble. Article 15. But anyway, 
So you stand up in respect for somebody. When's the other time you might stand up? How about if you're sitting there and all of a sudden you walk up, somebody just walks up and clocks Austin right across the face. And I'd stand up just in indignance. Like, what are you doing? Right? You'd stand up at that time, wouldn't you too? I believe that's why Jesus was standing at the right hand of God. In honor of Stephen, his martyr, and in indignance to what they were doing to him. And I think that's a very, very powerful point. Wish I'd have thought of it myself, but I didn't. So I just pass it on to you from somebody else. Verse 56, And said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears, and ran upon him with one accord, and cast him out of the city, and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. We'll talk about Saul here in a minute. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Talking about the sleep of death. So there he is, a good man, full of faith in the Holy Ghost. He made a good profession. He defended the faith and preached the word with such power and conviction that they killed him for it. And then when they stone him, he doesn't revile, he just, just like Jesus Christ, following in the footsteps of Christ. He didn't revile them. He didn't condemn them. He didn't call them names. He actually prayed for his persecutors just like Jesus did and said, Lord, lay not the sin to their charge. That was a good man. Now, God knows everything. God knew that if Stephen was martyred and stoned, God knew that Stephen would look up like he had the face of an angel. God knew that Stephen would pray for his persecutors. God knew that he would call upon the Lord Jesus Christ in faith. And even knowing the good that Stephen would do, he still allowed him to be martyred. Think about that. He did nothing worthy of death, but the Lord allowed him to be killed anyway. And then we have the next martyr, which was the Apostle James. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 2. I'll just give you a verse that shows that James was an apostle. Matthew 10 and verse 2. So I guess the moral of the story is here, if you don't want to get martyred, be the lousiest, lukewarm Christian that you can possibly be. And chances are the Lord's going to pick somebody better than you to, to martyr. Of course, I speak as a fool. But don't think, I'm going to be the best Christian I can possibly be. I'm going to do the best I can. I'm going to be full of faith. I'm going to, I'm going to keep the Lord's commandments, and then the Lord won't martyr me. <laughs> that, that's, the wrong, that's the wrong idea, because he, he just might in that case. But it's worth it if he does. In Matthew 10 and verse 2, Now the names of the twelve apostles are these, the first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother. So James the brother of John was one of the Lord's apostles. And it was this James that was one of Jesus' closest friends in Matthew 17 and verse 1. There would be a number of verses we could go to, but this one will suffice. You'll see often when Jesus is only with a few disciples, It's usually with these three, Peter, James, and John. These were his closest friends. Matthew 17 and verse 1. It says, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain. So Jesus had those that were closest to him. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with having certain people in the church that are closer to you than other people. And that... You know, Jesus certainly was no respecter of persons, and yet he had those that he was closer to than others. Now, James was killed uh, by King Herod when he was persecuting the church. What well, that is when Herod was. Acts 12, verses 1 through 2. It 
It says, Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. James was... Um, Actually, James, it doesn't say James was in prison. He put pre- Peter in prison after this because the Jews were pleased that he killed James. So I don't know if James was in prison at this point or not. It doesn't say. But Herod just kills him. It doesn't even say why he killed him. He just just did it. He just decided he was going to persecute the church. He didn't like the church. James is not only one of the 12 apostles right there. I mean, that separates him out from all the rest of the followers of Christ because he's one of the 12 that Jesus handpicked to follow him and to send into all the world to preach the gospel. Not only is he one of the 12, he's one of the three. He's one of the closest people on this earth to Jesus Christ. And yet, Herod just takes his head off with a sword. Just like that. And that's all they're said. I mean, it's not even a... That's all we're told. It's not like the Bible doesn't even make a big to-do about it. That's just what happens to faithful saints sometimes. Then you have Paul. Paul was the chiefest of the apostles. One of the chiefest, anyway. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 5. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 5. And I'm only giving you the, the people in the Bible that I can prove to you were martyred, uh, or that at least give strong indication that they were martyred. But all of the apostles, except for John, historically are said to have been martyred, and I don't doubt that at all. But I'm not even going to talk about those ones. I'm only giving you the ones that I can prove to you from the Bible. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 5. It says, for I suppose I was not a wit behind the very chiefest apostles. And he was right in his supposition there. He was not a wit behind the very chiefest of the apostles. Paul was used of God more than any of the other apostles. He went throughout all the world more than them. He preached the gospel. He converted more people. He started more churches. He wrote more scripture than all the rest of them combined. Or as much scripture as all the rest of them combined. He wrote half the New Testament. From Romans to Hebrews, Paul wrote all those books. There's 27 books in the New Testament. And Paul wrote, I think it was 14, so he wrote over half. So I guess he did write. If if my math is right, he did write more than all the other apostles combined of inspired scripture. Um... Second, Second Corinthians 11, verse 12. I'll have to count up those books. I think it's 14 anyway. Second, uh, Second Corinthians, pardon me. Second Corinthians 12, 11. Paul says, I am become a fool in glorying. Ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been uh, commended of you. For in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. See, Paul recognized what he was, but he also knew what was inside of him. He was the chiefest of the apostles. He was right up there with the rest of them, cream of the crop. But he knew that in him, that is in his flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Romans chapter 7, he talked about that. He knew that he was nothing. Look at Romans 11 and verse 13. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, which, you know, there's a lot more Gentiles out there than Jews. The Jews were just one small little nation. Uh, But Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, which means to the entire rest of the world outside of the Jewish nation. Romans 11 and verse 13, For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Paul made several evangelistic trips. All over the known world, he started numerous churches. Most of the churches you read about in the Bible were started by Paul. The, I'm assuming most of you know this, but somebody that has never read the Bible before or barely knows anything about it might not realize that the names of the books of the New Testament, most of those are named after the churches that they were written to. Romans was to the church at Rome. 
Corinth, first and second Corinthians was to the church in Corinth. Galatians were the, to the churches of Galatia. Ephesians to the church at Ephesus. Right, Philippians to the church at Philippi. Colossians to the church at Colossae. Thessalonians to the church at Thessalonica. So you, I think you get the point here. Um, so Paul started all those churches and a whole bunch more. There's a lot. I mean, there, there are not letters. There are not epistles to every church that Paul started. Our Bible would be enormous. He went to Antioch. He went to Iconium. He went to Pisidia. He went to all kinds of places and started churches. Um, and, and we don't have books or we don't have uh, letters to them in the Bible. He wrote an epistle to um, Laodicea, the church in Laodicea, but it's not inspired scripture. It's not in the Bible, but he refers to it in the book of Colossians. Now, notwithstanding all of the selfless work that he did for Jesus Christ, God still allowed Paul to be martyred. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 6. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 6. Paul says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. His offering that he's referring to is being offered on God's altar as a martyr, as a sacrifice for him. The time of his departure is leaving this earth. Right? He said to depart and be with Christ is far better. He's talking about his death here. And it's at hand, and at hand means within close reach. It's, it's here. It's, it's right upon him. And that is indeed what happened. He was martyred in Rome, as history has it. And then the last martyr we're going to talk about today is Peter. Remember, we talked about Peter a while back at the beginning of this sermon when Jesus told him how he would be killed. Well, Peter was an apostle. You remember we already saw that. Peter and Andrew, James and John. We saw that in Matthew 10 and verse 2. He was also one of Jesus' three closest friends. He might have been Jesus' closest friend. Jesus was pretty close with Peter. Probably Peter and John would seem like the two that were... He might have been the closest with John because John says that he was the disciple that Jesus loved. John refers to himself as that in about three three or four different places in the book of John, the Gospel of John. But Peter was very close to Jesus. Peter was probably the apostle that caused Jesus the most grief, too, because of his impetuousness and uh, immaturity. But, you know, sometimes your kid that causes you the most grief is actually the one that you love the most. You just have this affection for him, even though he irritates you, and he, he just, you know, constantly... Like my brother, my mom, you know, my brother's my mom's favorite. He, he likes her better than, or she likes him better than me, probably because he caused, him, caused her more grief than I did. So I joke about that. I don't know if she really likes him better than me. We, we, we go back and forth on that. She says she likes us both alike, but doesn't every mother say that? I mean, come on. So I still think she probably likes him better, but it's hard to tell. That was until my sister-in-law came along, and then she had a new favorite. She likes her better, and she likes both of us. So anyway. So Peter boldly preached the gospel in the face of persecution. Let's look at Acts chapter 4, 18 through 21. If you want to know a little bit about my mother and my brother, there's a country song called My Baby. Anybody ever heard it? He'll Always Be My Baby. If you never heard that song, anyway, listen to it. That's... That's my brother and my mother's song right there. Acts 4, 18 through 21. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So Peter was bold in his preaching. He goes on there in verse 21. It says, So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. Because Peter had healed this man. And he gave Jesus Christ the credit for it. And they didn't like that. And they told him to shut up and quit talking about Jesus Christ. Quit preaching in the name of Jesus. And Peter said, hey, you know, you can judge what you think is right. But 
We cannot but speak the things which we've seen and heard. We're going to keep talking about Jesus Christ regardless of what you do to us, whether you beat us, whether you imprison us, whether you kill us. It doesn't matter. And that has to be our attitude also. That's got to be our attitude in the truth, in the church. We are going to worship God publicly and collectively, period. It doesn't matter what any of them say. It doesn't matter what they threaten. We are going to do it. That's what we've got to do. Acts 5, 28 through 29. Saying, did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? We just read about it there in the previous chapter. They're indignant. Like these guys are, are insubordinate. They're not listening to their orders. And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Right there is our battle cry. That was the battle cry of the Walden Seas and the early Christians as they were being mercilessly and brutally persecuted by the Catholics. We ought to obey God rather than men. I don't care if there's another lockdown. I don't care if they say you can't have more than 10 people in a room. I don't care what they say. I don't care if they say churches can't meet or they can't sing or you got to wear a mask. I don't care what they say. We're going to meet in here and we're going to worship God or we're going to meet somewhere and we're going to worship God just like we've always worshiped God every Sunday regardless of what anybody says. Amen. Because Jesus Christ says that that's what we're supposed to do, not forsaking the assembling of, our, of ourselves together as the manner of some is. But so much the more, as he says, as you see the day approaching. The closer we get to the end, the more important it is to be in church. And then verses 40 through 42. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And when they departed from the presence of the council, and they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. They just did what God told them to do anyway. It didn't matter if they were beaten, if they were threatened. It didn't matter. They just kept doing what God told them to do. And that's what we're going to do. God being our helpers. Our helper. Peter was used by God to open the door of faith unto the Gentiles. Acts 15 and verse 7. Now, Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, but Peter was the first one that opened that door. Prior to Peter preaching to Cornelius in his household, no Gentile had ever had the gospel go to them. Now, there might have been some Gentiles that heard it in a crowd or something. I don't know. There was... Um, there was that centurion that came to Jesus. But the gospel was never sent to the Gentiles. It was never this opening of, of the door to where now the Gentiles are not on the outside. Now it's open to them. This was the first time that happened. In Acts 15 and verse 7, Peter recounts this experience that he had at Cornelius' house. And it says, And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Peter was a chosen special vessel. He would be the first one that went to the Gentiles with the gospel. That's a big deal. That, that is a... Um, it's a, it's a high position with Jesus Christ to have been the one that did that. But despite his great zeal and his love for Jesus Christ and the fact that he did nothing to deserve death, God nevertheless allowed him to be martyred. And we already read about it, but I'll read it to you again in John chapter 21, verses 18 and 19. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. Now, Peter knew, like Paul, 
that his time was at hand. Second uh, Peter 1 and verse 14, he said in this second and last epistle of his, he said, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. He's referring to what Jesus told him back there when he was still on earth. Peter knew that his time was short. This tabernacle is this body. It's the tent that our spirit resides in. And Peter was going to put that off, just like Paul said. He was, going to, he was ready to be offered and to depart. Now, if this has happened to these great men of God that we've seen here, the whole way back from Abel, Zechariah, Jesus Christ, John the Baptist, James, Peter, Paul, Stephen, all these great men of God, if it happened to them, don't be surprised if it happens to you if, if you desire to live godly in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12. This will be my last verse for you today. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. This is all. All.